Good morning. I see we all made it through the snowy weather that we had. Now it's switching to rainy weather, so typical Indiana. There you go. Um, Thank you for joining us this morning. If you're joining us online, we welcome you to our morning worship service. Um, Hopefully it's not as cold where you are, where we are, I guess. I don't know. Hopefully you're in a warm house, I suppose. Um, Just a few announcements this morning that I have for you. Uh, Tonight is our local conference where we present our annual reports. That is at 6 p.m. Just remember that is at 6 p.m. this evening. If you would like to come out uh, and see uh, our our final reports and and just kind of see what's going on, we can uh, set that up to get that going. Uh, Soup night, that is next Sunday evening. That is also at 6 p.m. That's on February 5th. Make a batch of your favorite soup and bring it to share with others. If you can catch a pot of boiling water on fire and you don't know if you should be making soup, I hear Campbell's makes some pretty good soup. I don't know. They they can do that too, so um, you could do that as well. Uh, Also, date night. Uh, If you are planning on doing our date night fundraiser, uh, please sign up for that in the North Foyer. There's a table set up. Uh, make sure to sign your names up, uh, sign a couple up. It is one couple per line. And then if you have children that you want to bring for child care, there's a box right next to the sign up to put how many kids that you are bringing so that I can properly staff what we need to do. Um, if you don't know, date night works. Uh, we provide you child care, but we do not feed your children. We only feed you. So we ask that you bring your kids fed so that they're not hungry or hangry. That's all we're asking, uh, so that we can enjoy uh, an evening with them. And then we serve you, the youth group serves you, um, and then um, we watch your children as as well, and then we play a game or two afterwards just to kind of fill out the evening. Um, This is not, you do not purchase tickets. It is donation only. So if you just can come and that's all you can do, that is fine. Uh, We do not require you to pay a certain amount. That is not what we're about. Uh, Yes, this is a fundraiser, but it's also designed for the youth to kind of give back to the church as well so that we can serve you. So if you are planning on doing that, we do need you to sign up here uh, because we have to purchase food and we want to make sure there's enough for everybody. So we don't want to guess. So please sign up uh, at that table out there for date night. Um, Also, there's a couple of other announcements. Uh, The Unity 66, we're doing a Super Bowl party at the church. Um, We'll be doing a a devotion during halftime because usually the halftime's not worth watching anyway. Uh, So we'll be doing a devotion during that. Uh, And then also there's some stuff for Winter Jam that I want you to be aware of. Uh, Just so you know, I must have a permission slip uh, because I am picking them up from school and I want to make sure parents know that they're coming with me. I don't want to get an angry phone call from a parent saying, hey, you stole my kid and I didn't know that they were going to uh, Winter Jam. So make sure you get a permission slip. I have those if you do not already have one. Uh, Be aware that the Care Connection table is still set up out there. Uh, So if you need assistance, uh, please grab a card so that you can uh, do that. Uh, And if you need to sign up, you can certainly contact them and they they are still needing more volunteers for that as well. Uh, If you're interested in church membership, please see Pastor Keith. He would be able to help you with that. And to, con- to continue the broken record statement, we still do not have our church numbered envelopes. So if you are waiting for those, sorry, uh, hopefully they'll be coming soon, uh, but we don't have a solid date for that quite yet. Um, there's a couple extra flowers, I think, that would, would have been for um, the flowers from Paul Nussbaum. Uh, our condolences uh, to our missionary church con- uh, expresses our condolences for Paul Nussbaum's family uh, on his passing. And then lastly, uh, on the back you can see of your bulletin, there is a, an announcement for the Hope Clinic baby shower. Uh, there are some baskets out in the north foyer that I saw with some signs. If you have stuff that you would like to donate for the baby shower, you can certainly do that. And if you don't know what to donate, uh, there are some suggestions and some different things Uh, that you can bring uh, based off of that list on the back. So that's all the announcements that I'm going to go over this morning. Uh, Let's go ahead and prepare our hearts for worship through prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for... Thank you for giving us hearts that feel. Thank you for being a God that feels with us. Thank you for being a God that is not just 
winding up the world and setting it, setting it off and just saying, well, I hope it goes. Thank you for being a God that's present. We pray this morning that you would grace us with your presence. We pray this morning that whatever we're struggling with, we'd be able to put aside and we'd be able to have hearts that are ready to worship you. If things are going great, I pray that we'd be able to sing those praises. If things aren't going well, I pray that we'd be able to see who you are and that you are in control. Be with us this morning. Help us to praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. And let's sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Feet may fall, we'll join thee. 
of the days at this time of year that are uh, starting now to get a little lighter in the mornings, but uh, we've got a little while before we uh, get to that daylight point. I know daylight changing times 
coming our direction. But, uh, this song, we want to use this song in this time as a, a prayer time. A, maybe a little different than might, what you might be used to, but it's an inviting time for you. If you want to come and kneel at the altar and pray about something. If you want to stand during this time to just be a representative and just just pray to the Lord and use it focused. The band has told me that we, we've done this song maybe once and, uh, and maybe you know the song, maybe you don't, but the spirit of what we want to communicate in this time and, and during this moment is to allow you a, an entry point for you to speak and get in touch with God in a different way than maybe you normally would. We're here. We're surrounded together. we got people around us that love us. All of us are here gathered in the name of Jesus. There's a different spirit here collectively than there is when we're out there on our own. And so use this as a, a point of grace to find a way, perhaps, you may be struggling. And it may not be sin. It may just be just struggling to grow. And you're needing some extra grace. And we just want to take this time that we're carving out right now to pray and to use this as that moment together. This song is called Waymaker. The chorus, the verse, uh, the choruses say he's our waymaker, uh, miracle worker, promise keeper. He's the light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. This is a song about acclamation. This is a song of faith. When you make these statements out loud, you are saying you believe in this, you're trusting this, you're hoping in this. This is different than other songs that we sing at prayer time. But this is saying out loud what I believe, what I stand on, what I'm holding to. And do you know that God is still working in your life even though you don't see it? Do you believe that? Do you trust in that? Even when I don't see it, you're working. There's a line in the bridge that says that over and over again. Even when I don't see it, you are working. It takes a amount of faith for you to hold on to that and grasp that and put that in your heart and believe it. He's not just a chain breaker, but he's also a way maker. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Let's sing that again. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you, oh, you are here, turning lives up. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are 
Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Are you needing some prayer this morning? If you want to stand up right now, we're going to take a moment to pray together. Maybe it's about you, maybe it's not, maybe it's for a family member, maybe it's for healing, maybe it's for connection, whatever that is, just stand right now, wherever you are. For those of you that are nearby, just, just kind of stretch a hand towards them as we pray for them this morning. God, Father, we thank you. You are such a good, good Father. You are near to us when we need you. You are close to us. We need you. These people are here together today, and we don't want to let them go be negligent in praying for them we lift them up in prayer today god provide them strength where they need strength provide them hope and faith where it is becoming weaker god be the strength in that weakness show yourself to be so close and so near god we pray for those that are representing here today some of them that doesn't know you that are that's lost god we pray that you would reach out to them and with your cords of love you would draw them closer to you, draw them nearer to you, woo them with your love. You are a way maker. Make a way for them. Speak to them in their hearts again. For those that are here, Lord, needing a touch from you today, we ask that God that you would provide that in your way, in your will, and in your time. God, we believe it as we sing it. We know that you are here today moving in our midst. And we want that. We desire that in our hearts, our own hearts, in our own lives, in our own home, in our marriages, in our families, in, in this church family. God, move here today. Work in this place. We need you. We want you. And we believe that, God, even though we don't see it, that you still are working. You will never stop working, God. We believe that Jesus said it with his own mouth. My Father is at work. He is always at work. And wherever there's a voice right now that's speaking hopelessness, God, we just identify that right now as the voice of the devil because there's always faith, hope, and love. Those three things remain. There is always hope. We speak that for our brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, trusting and holding on to that. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. Father, as we go in our time of hearing a word from you and a message from you this morning, continue to keep our hearts and our minds focused on you. Continue to keep us bolstered in our faith 
by the presence of the Spirit of the living God within our hearts, souls, and minds. Today we reach out to you. We love you with all of our hearts. We seek to do that. We are weak in ourselves, but we need the Spirit to help us to even love you the way we should. But God, we reach out to you today in hope and in faith, believing and in trusting that you are going to do great things. So we look for that expectantly. Individually, again, in our marriage, in our homes, our families, and here today as a church family, we stand on that promise together. In Jesus' name. And if you believe that, trust in that, hope in that, say amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the 11th chapter of John and mark that. We're going to come uh, to that. We're going to go through it uh, a little bit at a time, a little bit later. I just want to mention something that's on the calendar. Um, I don't know. There's something about here that made me kind of excited. Anybody read it close enough to guess what that was? It happens, it happens on uh, February 7th. That's World Chocolate Day. <laughs> I plan to observe World Chocolate Day. How about you? Yeah, that's a good day, too. A pastor sent his son to a Christian university, thinking that there he would have the opportunity to learn and grow in his faith, and he would be taught God's Word, and he would be equipped in his faith. At break, his son came home and said, Dad, you know, a lot, of these, a, lot of, a lot of these students don't believe that the Word of God is inerrant. In other words, that it's without error. And the pastor asked his son, Why? Why would they believe, why would they not believe that the Bible is without error? And the pastor's son replied, because many things in the Bible are scientifically impossible. <laughs> exactly. That's what a miracle is. That is what a miracle is. It is scientifically impossible. The God who created interrupts creation and the normal order of things in order to bring glory and honor to himself or to accomplish his purpose. The problem is, this is a very real, very real battle that is being fought even in the church of Jesus Christ. The Bible does not need science to bring validity to what it says. Science needs the Bible. The Bible does not change. Science does. The Bible does not need to change because it is true from everlasting to everlasting. The problem with the denial of inerrancy is if you deny that the word, if you deny that the Bible is totally accurate, 
you have to also deny the inspiration of Scripture, which means that God told people exactly what to write and they did it. Or you have to believe that God, who told people exactly what to write and they did it, is a liar or inaccurate or that there are certain things that he does not know. Or you have to believe that God is not and has not been capable of preserving his word through the ages and that he's just kind of let it slip and it really doesn't matter to him. And so, you know, through the many translations and everything, we're really off in the weeds. The inspiration of Scripture the Bible as God's authoritative word is of vital importance. The fact that God's word is totally accurate throws us into a question of everything. If you deny the inspiration of Scripture, if you deny the inerrancy of Scripture, if you deny the authority of Scripture, we're left to take this book, and that's all it would be if it's not God's Word. All we'd have left is to take this book and to look at it and say, well, this part I kind of like, this part I don't. How would we know what parts are his message to us and what, are, what isn't? How would we know that he really sent his son to be our savior? How would we know? If God's not totally accurate, then we are totally lost. Now, I realize that this is somewhat circular reasoning. However, let's look at what the Bible says about itself some of the claims that the Bible makes of itself. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 tells us that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All scripture is God-breathed. That's what we call inspired. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, so on. Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. I'm, I'm saddened by the fact that in many, in many religious circles, the inspiration of Scripture and the inerrancy of Scripture is being challenged. Never, never, never give that up. We will stand 
on the Word of God. And as a children's song says, if we have to stand alone on the Word of God, may we stand. And so that's nice, you know, not everything in the Bible, you know, some of the things in the Bible are scientifically impossible, and those things are called miracles, but it comes down to, okay, do you believe that? Do you believe everything in the Bible? Do you believe that the God of truth gave us his message and that it is all true? Hmm. For instance, do you believe that God created everything that exists from nothing? Can you take Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and say, that's how it happened? Or do you have to take and mix a little scientific theory stuff into it and say, God must have done it that way? Wow. The scientific explanation requires more faith to believe than the Genesis chapter 1 and 2 because it is scientifically impossible for something to come from nothing. Let's see you put that theory to test. Let's see you apply scientific processes to that. Test it. Reproduce it. Bring to something from nothing. It is an impossibility. If you don't believe Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and you have to mix a little science in here, and a little bit of this, and a little bit of air, and a little bit of atheism in here and there, you got nothing. If you can't handle the first and believe the first few words of the book, the rest is in jeopardy as well. So do you believe that God sent a flood upon the earth that covered the entire earth? All of it? Not a local flood as some think, but a universal flood that covered everything. Do you believe that really happened? Or is that just some myth? Some tradition, some story. Do you believe that God parted the Red Sea so that the people of Israel could escape from the Egyptian army? And that the people of Israel crossed over on dry ground? And that the Egyptian army drowned in the sea when the waters came back together? Do you believe that's real? Do you believe that's a historical fact? It's scientifically impossible. Do you believe that God made an axe head float? Do you know that's in the Old Testament? God made an axe head float. No one, it wasn't a child's axe head made out of plastic, unless you want to believe the miracle that that plastic axe head was able to chop wood. Do you believe it? Do you think that really happened? Do you believe that God made the sun to stand still? <laughs> yeah, those who deal with dates still struggle with sorting that one out. But they know it's there. Do you believe that Jesus really walked on the Sea of Galilee? He actually walked on the Sea of Galilee. Or do you have to throw in some, well, there must have been stepping stones or there must have been something. Do 
Do you believe that Jesus really fed over 5,000 people, and many think it's more like 15,000 when you count the women and children, with a small boy's lunch? And do you believe they had 12 basketfuls left over? They had more at the end than they started with. Do you really believe that? Do you think that's a historical fact? Do you believe that Jesus was really born of a virgin with no human father? Scientifically impossible. But do you believe that it happened? Do you believe that Jesus raised a man named Lazarus from the dead? Do you believe the Bible? This morning we want to look at this instance, this miracle, as Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. We're going to ask ourselves, do we believe that or not? Is that real or not? Is it historical fact or not? And Lazarus isn't the only resurrection that, that we know of. I mean, I've, I've got a list of them. I'll run through them real quick. Uh, there's a resurrection of the widow's son in Zarephath. Remember, uh, there was... Uh, a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. And the prophet said, please make me something. And the widow did. And there continued to be flour. The flour and oil never were used up. And then her son died. And the prophet raised him back to life. There's a resurrection of the Shumanite son. There's a resurrection of the man that was thrown into Elisha's grave. Now there's an interesting one. I'm not, I don't have time to go into all those, but yeah, you, can, you can look them up. There's a resurrection of Jairus' daughter. There's a resurrection of the young man at Nain, the widow's son. There's a resurrection of unknown sin, saints during the crucifixion. That one just boggles my mind. Jesus rose from the dead, and the saints came out of their graves, and they walked around Jerusalem. Did, did you know that was part of the resurrection account? Do you believe that really happened? Woo, that's scary. I want to know. I want to know, did, 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 did they, you know, if they walked around a little while and people saw them, did, did they go back and get in the grave again? Or did they live for a while and have to die again? You know, what was that like? There was a resurrection of a woman named Tabitha or Dorcas. And there was a resurrection of Eutychus. I love that story. The Apostle Paul was a long-winded preacher, and he went on and on until midnight or so, and, and uh, it was hot and stuffy up there on the third floor of this, this uh, building they were in, and he fell out of the window and was killed. Poor Eutychus. I promise I won't go that long today. <laughs> but the Apostle Paul went down and he was raised from the dead. And then there's a resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that one? Do you believe that one? What about your resurrection? Do you believe that there's a time when you also be raised to eternal life? It's scientifically impossible. We can't prove it by science. Do you still believe it? So let's look. Let's look at John chapter 11, and we'll kind of walk through it a little bit. And uh, we're going to see some of the details of the resurrection of Lazarus. We'll start off with Jesus, dear friends. In Bethany, uh, Jesus had th uh, friends that were, they were a family. Their names were Mary, 
Martha, and Lazarus. And they are very dear to Jesus. You know, you have, you have, you know, really, you have friends that are in the same family and, and, and you, you really love them and care for them and they're really special and you love to spend time with them. Uh, this, I think, was the case with Jesus in regard to this family. And you may know Mary. Mary was the, the person who sat at Jesus' feet a little bit later after the, after the resurrection of, of Lazarus. She, but she sat at Jesus' feet. That was her, that was her uh, personality. She, would, she was the one who wanted to learn. She was a relational individual. And then there's Martha. Martha was the one who was the hostess with the mostest. She was the one who would uh, prepare the meals and make sure the house was clean. And uh, she kind of overdid it at times uh, to the exclusion of the relationship type things. And then there's Lazarus, who is their brother. And uh, he also was one who was loved by Jesus. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture in, in John 11, verse 1 says, Now there was a man named Lazarus who was sick. He was from Bethany in the village of, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. They sent a message, I assume it was by, by a messenger to Jesus. And they said, Lazarus is sick. When Jesus heard this, he said, this, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. But we find that then it says that he stayed where he was two more days. Jesus did not immediately rush to Lazarus' side. Jesus stayed where he was for two more days. Can you imagine the sisters? They send a messenger to Jesus. Lazarus is sick. He's really, really sick. You need to come. And Jesus doesn't come. And he doesn't come. And he doesn't come. And Lazarus dies. Can you imagine the angst? Can you imagine the, 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 maybe even the anger? The frustration and perhaps they were at the window of the house watching, waiting for Jesus to come. But he didn't. Has that ever happened to us? Have you ever been frustrated by the slowness of God's answers to your requests? And you pray and you pray and you pray and Jesus doesn't come. You pray and you pray and you pray and things get worse. I think the sisters experienced that. Where are you, Jesus? But it was all for God's glory. Then we find Jesus' de declaration of faith. He's like a coroner, in a sense. In verse 11, after Jesus had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly. 
Lazarus is dead. I kind of wonder what the disciples thought, you know. <laughs> oh, Lazarus is asleep. Oh, good. He's getting better. And then he follows that up by saying, Lazarus is dead. What? Lazarus had died. But there's a reason for the delay so that you may know and believe. And then I find an interesting thing then in verse 16. Then Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let's also go so that we may die with him. What, what's that all about? Well, they knew that the religious leaders were threatening to kill Jesus and they wanted to kill Jesus. And so if he would get in close proximity and they would find out where he was, the disciples thought, well, they're going to come and kill Jesus. Thomas, the same guy that we call the doubter all the time, which I don't think is totally fair. Maybe we should call him Thomas the Courageous, because he, he said, you know, let's, let's go with him. We'll die with him. And then we find Jesus' death-defying deity Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the, in the tomb for four days. Bethany's less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Where have you been? And I wonder what caused her to say, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. You're looking forward to an event. You need to be looking to a person. I am the resurrection and the life. Whenever you see the words, Jesus using the words I am, it brings to mind his deity because when, uh, when Moses, when God approached Moses, Moses said, who should I say sent me? He was concerned that if he was going to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, would they accept it? And so he wanted, he wanted a, a higher authority. He said, who should I say sent me? Do you remember what God's response was? Tell him that I am sent you. You might say that's strange. I am. I am, I am. I am is now transliterated Yahweh. I am. Basically means that I exist. 
I am the uncaused causer. I am the, I am the, the, the uncreated creator. I exist. It speaks of its eternality. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. That's eternal life. He who lives and believes in me will never die. Eternal life. This is Jesus' death defying deity. The resurrection was in him. And then Jesus asked, asked Martha in uh, the end of verse 26. Do you believe this? That's where we get down to reality. Do you believe this? And for us, do you believe the Bible? Do you believe God's Word? Do you believe it even though it's scientifically impossible? Do you believe this? And Martha's response... Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Verse 27. I believe that you're the Messiah. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you're the one that's sent to save us. I believe that you are God. That you, I believe in your deity. Then she went and she called her sister Mary and said, The teacher's here. He's asking for you. Verse 29, when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, we've heard this before. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Both sisters. You see, they knew Jesus as a healer. And they knew that if Jesus had been there, he would have been able to heal their brother Lazarus. We sent for you. Why didn't you come? When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with him also with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? And here we find Jesus' distress. In verse 35, Jesus wept. Why? Didn't didn't Jesus know what he was about to do? Didn't he know that he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead? Of course he knew. So why did he weep? Why didn't he get that mischievous smile and go, just just wait and see. Why did he weep? When Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who had come along also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit. And troubled. Jesus had very real human emotions. And when the Bible says that we are to, to weep with those who weep, we're to mourn with those who mourn, he did just that. His heart went out to the weeping sisters, and he wept as well. It is a demonstration. It is Jesus' compassion coming out in a human, very human manner.
And then we find that in verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone. He said, but Lord, by this time there's a bad odor for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. On about the fourth day, decay began, you know, would begin to sit, set in. I wonder if there was more and if he, if he had to convince them to take away the stone. And Jesus looked up and he said, Father, I thank you for all that. I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Some people <laughs> remark that it's a good thing that he used Lazarus' name and said, Lazarus, come out, or all the graves would have emptied. Uh, I, I don't know. That's kind of someone's attempt to be humorous. Lazarus, come out. It is significant that Lazarus had been dead for four days. Because the Jews at that time believed that when someone died, their spirit hovered over their body for three days and then departed on the fourth day. That was just what they believed. So the fact that it was four days would have been an even greater miracle to the Jews that he didn't just have the spirit re-enter the body, you know, the spirit was hovering there. The spirit had departed from their perspective. Don't take that as theology. I don't know about you, but I, I, you know, Lazarus is one of the guys that um, I just wonder, did he want to come back? In fact, there's a, a Jewish tradition that says that when they unwrapped Lazarus, the first thing that he said was, does this mean that I'm going to have to die again? and that he never smiled from that day on. Jewish tradition, not the inspired word of God. Lazarus came out of the grave, they took his grave clothes off and, and let, him, let him go. But then we find Jesus' dangerous enemies. Therefore, many of the Jews, verse, verse 45, who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, placed their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. The chief priests and Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Oh, my goodness, you'll never believe what Jesus did. We've got to go tell the, the religious leaders. They'll want to know about this, and it'll gain me some points with them. And so some ran, ran to tell. And in the Sanhedrin, 
They said, what are we accomplishing? Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Let's skip down to verse 53. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Kind of interesting. Last week we talked about, uh, or a couple weeks ago we talked about Jesus cast the demons from Legion, the demoniac, into the herd of pigs. Remember that? And what happened? All the people of the region came out and told me, would you please leave? Would you please leave? So Jesus casts the demons out of this guy and, and he's sitting there normal. And so they're saying, we can't have that. Go away. There's something about that that's bad for us. Go away. And here we have Jesus healing, not only healing, but raising from the dead Lazarus, probably a well-known individual in Bethany. And they want to kill him for it? Does that make sense? Does that sound like a good religious leader? <laughs> those, those folks, they could be vicious. And so Jesus' enemies were very upset because people were believing in him. If, uh, if we look ahead a little bit, Um, chapter 12 verse 10 if you want to look ahead just a little bit they had a a dinner in Jesus honor after he raised Lazarus from the dead and in verse 10 it says so the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well We can't have this guy going around. He was raised from the dead, and people are going to believe that Jesus really is the Son of God because he raised him from the dead. So we're going to have to kill him too. Wow. You know, my, my mind's a little warped sometimes. Okay. I thought I might get an amen on that one. But the way I look at it, I, you know... If they were going to kill Jesus, they wanted to kill Jesus and they wanted to kill Lazarus, I wonder if they thought to themselves, well, we better kill Jesus before we kill, that, kill Lazarus because Jesus might just raise him from dead again. How do you kill somebody that can raise people from the dead? This was a very significant miracle. It is thought that this was about 30 to 33 days before Jesus went to the cross. The resurrection of Lazarus from the dead is scientifically impossible, so do you believe it? No, that's our question for today. Do you believe it? Do you believe the word of God? Do you believe that it is God's inspired word? Do you believe it carries God's authority? Does, do, do you believe that God, through his word, tells us how we should live our lives? Do you believe that God, through his word, teaches us how we can have forgiveness from our sins and have eternal life? Do you believe that the Bible is accurate? Or do you believe that God is inaccurate somehow? Do you believe that, well, maybe over the years we kind of got a little warped and we're kind of off-center here and there in our translations and so on, or do you believe that God can preserve his word? It's an important question. Do you believe in miracles? 
or do you have to have scientific evidence to back it up? God's word will stand alone every time. It'll stand alone in your life. It is powerful, it is strong, and it'll never pass away. Worship team. I believe in miracles because I believe in God. If you don't believe, if you don't believe in miracles, you don't believe in the God of the Bible. You believe in something else. I don't know what. But it is necessary to believe in miracles if you believe the God of the Bible because the God of the Bible is a God of miracles. If he made it, he can interrupt it. If he made it, he can make little changes here and there to accomplish his purposes. All that's left is, do you believe in miracles? Well, let's stand together and sing our final song, I Know Whom I Have Believed. And when Pastor was sharing about Jesus and Lazarus, I was thinking, why would you, if Jesus could raise Lazarus from the dead, why would you then want to kill Jesus? Because he could just raise himself up from the dead. But that's exactly what happened, and that's why we, we believe. Let's sing this song together. I know whom I have believed. Just give us the first note for the second verse. We're going to sing this a cappella. It's our last verse for today. Let's sing it together. I know not how this saving faith to me Please join me in prayer. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection and the life resides in Jesus. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the resurrection, the resurrection of Lazarus and the resurrection of Jesus. Moreover, our own resurrection to eternal life. Lord, we pray that you would solidify our faith and that we might be confident in who you are, and what you did, what you've done. And Lord, that we might live in such a way that recognizes that the Bible is your word. It carries your authority that it is accurate, that it's truthful. And Lord, may we live out your directives that we find there. Now I pray that you would dismiss us with your, with your blessing. And Lord, we pray that we might represent you well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless and keep you. You are dismissed. For I know.